bow for prayer. God of all there is, seen and unseen, draw us near to you that our hearts might be made one. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Wow, well, I've missed you the last two Sundays. But what a wonderful experience uh, we pastors had studying in Wesley's England. <clears throat> My ministerial colleagues and I traced our Methodist roots all over England, visiting the Epworth Rectory where Wesley was born and where he was saved from a fire started in the parsonage, the rectory, probably by people in the congregation because they didn't like Samuel, his dad, being their pastor. Glad we don't do stuff like that today. <laughs> we prayed in the church where John was baptized as an infant and where he took his first communion uh, in the Anglican church, the Church of England. We saw the site uh, where John Wesley preached on his father's grave. He left the Church of England. Uh, well, not really, but he was seen as leaving the Church of England, and so he was not allowed to preach in the cathedral, and so he stood on his dad's uh, sarcophagus, really, and preached. And I might or might not have stood on it and had my picture taken. Uh, we'll talk about that later. We traveled to Christ Church, Oxford, where John and his brother Charles studied to Bristol, the site of Wesley's new room where Methodism really got started officially, to London where John, with his own money, built the church, Wesley's chapel, and his home right beside it and where he died, and we got to see uh, his grave and the markers. Divinity School, Duke Divinity School professor Lacey Werner, a Wesley specialist, gave lectures and sidelights. It was a trip of a lifetime. What wonderful historical roots we Methodists have. Speaking of history, I read a, politi a politician's speech this week that intrigued me. The speech began this way. We, America, have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We've grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. We've become too proud to pray to the God that made us. Did you read that speech recently? Well, probably not, because it was given in 1863 by then-President Abraham Lincoln. Wow. Sounds like it could have been spoken to us, doesn't it? Now, would you imagine that someone who was as committed to turning the known world upside down for the right purposes as Lincoln was would have said that the reason for all the mess in the world in his day was that people had lost their faith in God? That's what the president said. For the next weeks, we're going to be talking about that essential component of the Christian life called faith. And as we explore it, we're going to be talking about developing a faith that endures. We'll be seeking answers to practical questions. Now, that in and of itself brings up a singular question. What is faith? What is it and how do we get it? Is it a gift? And if so, who gives it and how is it received? Is there a responsibility we accept in order to receive faith or does faith just become bestowed upon us automatically, accidentally? Is faith something you and I can work on ourselves, or is it something we just accept? And what are the marks of faith? How is it that some people seem to be filled with it, faith that is, while many others, including a number of us at times, continue to yearn for it, to seek for more, to pray and even beg for it? Now, 
if you have all that figured out already, uh, if you can answer those questions for yourself, you can slip away quietly during the next prayer, which won't happen until after the sermon, by the way. Uh, but if you don't, let's talk for a few minutes together. Faith is certainly an essential element in the Christian life. The Apostle Paul spoke about it often. In Ephesians, he tells us that we are saved by faith. In 2 Corinthians, he reminds us that we are to walk by it, and that means to live by it. In our lesson from Hebrews today, the writer tells us something extremely important about faith. We're reminded that without it, it is impossible for us to please God. In Romans, Paul makes the hard ruling that anything we do apart from our faith is sin. Okay, let's get a handle on things. What is faith? For the next several weeks, this will be our definition. Faith is a reliable and assured confidence and trust in something. Now that's simple. A reliable and assured confidence in something. Everyone has faith. One of my pastor friends said, faith is at the heart of life, everyone's life. And then he continued. I just realized the other day that I went to a doctor whose name I couldn't pronounce. He gave me a prescription I couldn't read. I took it to a pharmacist I'd never met before. Before I could be given the medication, though, she made me sign a waiver about the medication that I did not understand, and yet, when I got home, I took that medicine. Now that's faith, he said. <laughs> it's something that's a part of all of life. The fact is, you and I can't get through a single day without dealing with faith. When you flip on a light switch in your home, you trust your wiring and the power company. When you turn on the ignition switch in your car, and I worried about this being away two weeks, I didn't know if my car would start. Um, but we trust the battery, the starter, alternator, engine. When we mail a letter, we trust the U.S. Postal Service. Sometimes, of course, your faith might be misplaced because faith is only as valuable as the object of that faith. For followers of Christ, faith is a reliable and assured confidence and trust in the person and ministry of Jesus Christ. Faith means we believe that Jesus is who he says he is. The Son of God sent to save his people, all of us, from our sins. So how do we come to that belief? And is faith something we accept even though it may not always seem clear? This is a major issue. Actually, classic Christian tradition has always valued rational, logical truth. John Wesley struggled with that at times, especially early in his ministry when his faith didn't seem to him to be logical. Classical Christian tradition doesn't hold that faith involves the abandonment of reason. One church father has said that faith is a trust in and commitment to what we have reason to believe is true. And that's exactly where you and I are. Jesus never meant for faith to be in any way blind. That's why he came back to meet personally with Thomas, who wouldn't believe without seeing the marks and putting his hand in Jesus' side. Regarding Thomas the doubter, scholar Peter Williams reminds us that Thomas wasn't asked to believe without evidence. Prior to Jesus' visit with them, he had been asked to believe on the basis of the other disciples' testimony. Thomas initially lacked the firsthand experience of the evidence that had convinced them. He was in our place so often. Moreover, the reason John, the writer of the gospel and the disciple, gives for recounting those events is that he had seen the evidence with his own eyes. He watched as Jesus was alive and present with literally hundreds of persons after the resurrection. John wrote, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, but these are written that you may see and hear and believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. What John was saying was, what I, see, what I speak about isn't hearsay. 
I was with hundreds of people who saw him alive and well at the same time with our own eyes. We heard and even touched him. It's important for you to believe, he says, because therein you receive eternal life. With my lead academy group of pastors, I was privileged to spend an, a day and a half uh, in Oxford, England over the past two weeks. Oxford is the place where John Wesley and Brother Charles studied in order to prepare for ministry at Christ Church and then at Lincoln College. The place where those brothers and friends first became Methodists and were called Methodists. It wasn't a positive term. There were other names they had. Bible moths was what some of the students called them. Methodist wasn't meant to be positive. The people who were their classmates thought the Wesleys have gone overboard for God. Oxford was also the home later of theologian W. H. Griffiths Thomas. In contrast to faith being seen as some kind of blind trust in the absence of evidence, that scholar reminds us that our faith is not blind but intelligent and begins with the conviction of mind based on adequate evidence. People of faith, we must always remember that. British apologist John Lennox argues that the validity of faith depends on the strength of the evidence on which the belief is based. We all know how to distinguish between blind faith and evidence-based faith. We are well aware that faith is only justified if there's evidence to back it up. Evidence-based faith is the normal concept on which we base our everyday lives, even in the spiritual realm. Every religion is based in faith in some person or supposed truth. Buddhists have faith in the ways of Buddha. Muslims trust in Muhammad. Hindus believe in various gods, thousands of them actually. Most of the above people and religions put faith in their ability to keep the rules or to be good enough to satisfy their god or gods or reach their paradise or build up good feelings or karma or feel some oneness with nature. But that is not what our faith is about. The scripture lesson for today from Hebrews comes from what many view as the chapter of faith or the faith chapter. The writer details that it was by faith that our forebears followed God. He begins, now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made, of, made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he didn't experience death. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who had pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he, that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. That's the crux of our conversation this morning. I love how the passage begins. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. That deals with a big concept in a few words. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. It's important that we're on the same page right here. Faith is seeing the invisible, but not the non-existent. Faith is seeing the invisible, but not the non-existent. Some people think faith is a believing in something that's not actually there. Biblical faith believes God when God tells us there is a reality too great to be seen by our eyes. And in that reality, our faith means that we keep our focus on God who is sovereign in spite of circumstances, not on the circumstances themselves. Wow, that's beautiful. Making a concept that's both simple and unimaginable something we can all sink our teeth into. Faith is not a blind leap into the dark. Now, there are those who would tell us that we have to ignore logic and reason in order to believe in God. The fact is, I would say that the belief that there is no God is the belief that requires an unreasonable kind of faith. One of my friends um, is always bringing things to me that seem to be working 
gets the faith and asks me how I respond and process. And he shared something with me. It's, it's out there because I've also found it on the Internet that's um, in our culture. It, read, it reads, the definition of Christianity, the belief that a cosmic Jewish zombie who was his own father can make you live forever if you symbolically eat his flesh and telepathically tell him that you accept him as your master so he can remove an evil force from your soul that is present in humanity because of a rib woman who was convinced by, by a talking snake to eat from a magical tree. Yeah, it ends. Christianity makes sense. I think my friend thought that would shake me up, and I'll have to tell you it takes a lot more than that. Um, but I began to think about it and thought, actually, that if you take out two words meant to be funny and cute, I guess, zombie and telepathically, that pretty much sums up Christianity. We do believe in a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It certainly makes a lot more sense than the secular humanist faith statement that might be summed up by saying, by faith we believe the intelligent universe evolved from mindless matter so that order accidentally emerged from chaos. Of course, evidence for a chance evolution of human self-awareness statement of faith is diminishing. Science itself continues to consistently show that order does not grow out of chaos. And that design points to a designer. I don't know about you, but maybe I do. I find Hebrews 11.3 to be much more plausible. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Both of those creeds require faith, but Christian faith is compatible with logic and reason, and we must not allow that to be taken away from us. It's based on historical evidence. It's supported by biblical record, by personal testimony, and by our own experiences. About faith, one pulpit giant shared about his pilgrimage. I prayed for faith and thought that someday it would come down like lightning and strike me. But that faith didn't seem to come. One day I read in Romans that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I had up until this time, he said, closed my Bible and prayed for faith. Now I opened my Bible and began to study, and my faith has been growing ever since. So where do you find yourself in all of this? Do you believe? Can you believe? Faith comes easy to some of you who, like John, arrived at the tomb and saw that Jesus wasn't there. The scriptures say John saw and he believed. Over, done with, end of story. But faith isn't so easy for others of us who, like Peter, saw the same thing but left the tomb shaking his head in confusion, not knowing what to believe. What has just happened? However, however, faith comes with even more difficulty to others like Thomas who have to touch something concrete to be able to believe. And you know what? All of those are all right. The powerful God of all there is is not a cookie-cutter God who might say something like, you all have to come to me the same way, believing what some would call all the trivial stuff to have a relationship with me. The God of all there is, in fact, says, the thing you have to do is keep your mind and question and even doubt, knowing that order doesn't come on its own out of chaos, and finally being able to come to the reasonable understand that I am the one who created it all, and then walk by faith. And when you do, God says, you can know for sure that I am pleased. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.